Well, welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I am an Episcopal priest living here in Austin, Texas, and uh, have had the gift of recovery uh, coming up on 49 years this December. And for that, I am very, very grateful to uh, too many people to uh, to give credit to, uh, or we'd, we'd be here for another hour. Um, I, I started uh, undergoing a real change at uh, 20 years sober uh, when I was uh, in the program of AA and got uh, really taken up with the, the history and particularly something that they were doing in the original program called two-way prayer as part of a morning quiet time. And I started studying that and doing that, and it literally changed my life, sent me in uh, very different directions from uh, where I was going. Uh, one of them was actually becoming a, a, a priest and uh, changing jobs and, and things of that nature. So um, this is some powerful stuff we're, we're dealing with here. And if, if, you, if you're not familiar with two-way prayer, I'd encourage you to go to our website of the same name, and I am going to be doing another workshop on the on the process. Uh, teach it. It's a two and a half hour, two and a half hour, excuse me, workshop on Saturday, December the eleventh, and you can get information about that on the website, or you can write me at twowayprayer at gmail .com, and I will be happy to send you a flyer for that and encourage you to spread that around and bring a friend and. Uh, we will, uh, as usual, I hope, have a really good time. We are finishing up our series now on uh, invitation to a great experiment. It's a, it's a very important book in recovery that was written by a man by the name of Tom Powers. He was uh, a sponsee of uh, uh, Bill Wilson and helped him in writing uh, the second edition of the big book, AA Comes of Age, and probably most importantly, the book 12 Steps and 12 Tradition also contributed uh, frequently to the AA grapevine and had a newsletter himself uh, that was very powerful and uh, a pretty brilliant guy and uh, excellent author. And so we're, we're, we're going through his book that he wrote and uh, we've been really gifted to have Matt D from upstate New York who is uh, the archivist for All Addicts Anonymous. And that's a group that uh, Tom, Tom started many, many years ago to kind of kind of keep the original program of AA uh, going and, and staying focused and not drifting uh, as spiritual programs have a tendency to do. So uh, Matt, it's been really wonderful having you with us and uh, um, looking forward to today's episode. So welcome aboard. Me too. Thank you. Yeah. I thought we'd begin by uh, kind of where, where the, the last episode uh, trailed off uh, because Tom was leading up to the key. You know, he's talking about this transformation and change and uh, how we go about it and, and lots and lots of good material. But he, he concludes the last chapter saying, our situation then with regard to God's will, which he defines as the door to all happiness, and prayer, which he defines as the key to opening that door. He says it is simple, but difficult. The facts we need to keep in mind are few, but inescapable. Our failure to know and do God's will arises not because he does not give knowledge and strength, the things we ask for in step 11, but because we have lost the capacity to receive. Two revolutionary steps lead from the life of the spiritually dead uh, to the life of the living. One, realization that we have lost the capacity to know and do the will of God, and that life is fruitless without it. There's a contradiction. And asking with humility and courage, and a sufficient awareness of desperate need that the capacity be restored to us. This kind of asking constitutes the very metal and mold of the key, the life of prayer, and that is our next consideration. 
So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, in this episode. We're going to really dig into prayer as as Tom sees it, and uh, maybe hopefully as as Matt uh, practices it. Uh, and, and he starts off, um, and Matt, you can kind of kick us off with this, with the basics of prayer. He says there's low prayer, middle prayer, and high prayer. Could, could you maybe work us through those three? Um, yeah. The um, Again, thanks for having me on. Some of these things that we dive into are not, not always easy, and um, I really appreciate that, uh, you know, I've been working at this stuff for a lot of years and my inability to communicate it, you know, it makes all the more reason, uh, it, you know, I'm appreciative that, that we had someone that actually would take the time to communicate these things and had written it down for us. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot here. Um, so he goes through the, the prayer and he breaks it out into, into low, um, middle and high, mm -hmm. uh, um there's a actual definition to, that he goes through and um it's it's given in the book uh, yeah he says low prayers like talking to god as mother father it's a simple yeah. kind of process and then middle right. is is taking to god the needs of other children <laughs> i like that yes and then high prayer the child is wrapped beyond personal concerns and immersed in pure worship and adoration of the living flame of love, which is the source and goal. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, first of all, I wanted to back it up from the very beginning. And, and I've mentioned this before, the book st always starts out at honesty. Uh, we just talked about the will of God and we're not throwing, you know, we're not throwing around the, this idea of the will of God you know, as though this is a thing that we slam dunk do on a regular basis. No more. I think it makes me think very much about the, the Oxford group and the relationship AA had when the, when the absolutes came around. They said, wait a minute, these are not things you can claim absolute attainment to, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, we approach things like prayer more effectively or we receive the capacity when we approach them from a place of ego deflation. I think this this first part of prayer, low prayer, a mm -hmm. uh, child speaking to his father, the whole the whole twelve step fellowship was founded off of low prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, Bill Wilson is, uh, if there is a God, may He show Himself. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't, don't <laughs> knock low prayer. <laughs> don't knock low prayer at all. Uh, of course, obviously, there's it's important that we we work regularly in in middle prayer where we're praying for other people and their concerns. And so it doesn't stay solely at low prayer where it's, right. where it's just about ourselves. But you, you'll notice that, that these prayers may, may actually give way to high prayer as Bill Wilson's did. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, it, he, you know, the, the description here of adoration, the living flame of love, which is the source and goal, you know, Bill Wilson's experience was, was that of, literally that the wind was a, made of a spirit that blew through him you know mm -hmm. uh this thing is it went from <laughs> low prayer to high prayer and right. you don't have control over high prayer yeah you don't uh, know when it's coming you don't know when it's coming and you can't you can't force god's hand into giving it to you right uh if we did we'd turn him into a some version of a uh, a gumball machine that we just drop our little prayers in and pull the lever you know, right. but there is there is something very important about about low and middle prayer, and um, they are the possibility of opening up towards high prayer if God will will grant us worthy to receive it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 showing up is key. <laughs> you know, if if uh, to me that's the problem uh, I I had with prayer and meditation. Uh, if if you if you just try to do it on occasion, it's not usually going to be terribly effective. That that it's like going to the gym. If I go to the gym once a year, um, uh, don't don't expect great results. You know. Absolutely. I was just yeah. read this. Uh, I've been reading um, Gerald Hurd recently, and it's um, I I haven't really read much of his material. Um, mm -hmm. 
although he was really a spiritual director for both Tom and, and Bill Wilson, um, his influence in their life was immense, more than anybody knows in the AA history books. And uh, there's a quote he has there, he basically says, without prayer, nothing is possible. Like it, it is, it's, it is the center of all life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny, you know, we come into AA and it's like, okay, this is just one of the steps or something that we do. And I'll, I'll, I'll put a couple minutes in or, right. uh, you know, whatever. Uh, in the meantime, the entire fellowship is a response of prayer. It is the first thing that really, if you look at the steps in, in order, I would say the first thing is that Ebby said to Bill, you got to get honest with yourself. And in the condition of ego deflation that occurred off of that, like, you know, yuck, <laughs> this right. is the last thing I want to do. But in, in, that, in that, that very critical state of, of complete ego deflation, uh, he had the capacity to be able to say a prayer. And it was obviously, it was not only heard, but just the answer to it has been rippled out to every person who comes to this fellowship for help. You know, it is, it's there. And it is, it was so primary to the, to the beginning of this program. It has to be equally so in, in each of our lives and my, and obviously, and if you're aiming as this book is, is trying to uh, offer in the form of exper an experiment, do we want, do we really want to know God? Again, I've been in, back into Gerald Hurd here, but he said an interesting thing about uh, wanting to know God. He said, um, we, we often don't think about the fact that maybe God wants us to know him. You know, maybe he, he actually is interested enough to, to want us to, to get to know him. Uh, how, the, how can you do that without prayer? Right. Tom's, Tom says none of us is really very good at prayer or at love. And he, he equates the two. And I really like that. Uh, but that God somehow takes over and works through us, basically in spite of us, you know? Yeah. Uh, he says, in my worst times, I am miserably divorced from prayer and love. In my middle times, I hopefully grope toward loving and praying. And in my best moments, I am caught up in real love and real prayer, not mine, but his. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's really a, a, a critical distinction is that, mm -hmm. you know, that you, we think often of, um, oh, I love someone as though it is something that emanates from me and is ushered out towards another person. Right. And, and he makes this point that both prayer and love are gods. They belong to him. If, if we're at all to extend it outward, it's, it's on loan. <laughs> it's, we are not the source of it. You know, we are only a, 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 a transferable, you know, component in it. Yeah, and we have to recognize, or at least begin to recognize, the blockages that we put in the way of that love uh, coming, coming into us. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Very much. And I mean, the majority of the steps are, are put in place for that very reason. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, if the culmination yeah. is conscious contact and spiritual awakening, this is that's why. Right, uh, and and then uh, speaking of that, uh, uh, Tom, Tom moves into the area of morals, you know. And you know, when I'm talking to people about the four absolutes, uh, it 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 just never uh, fails that people will say, okay, honesty, good, unselfishness. Who's against that? Love, beautiful, purity, look out, and 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 he brings it right in. This question of purity, as it is related to prayer, morals. He's talking about, you know, and yeah. Oxford Group changed its name to Moral Rearmament, you know. Uh, yeah. So this morals question. I wonder if you could uh, dive into that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Um... Because if this experiment is real, if God really is real, and, and we are to make contact, conscious contact mm -hmm. with this power, the last thing you want to do is make contact from a dirty source, you know, 
you, you really want to come, come into and approach this thing in as clean of a way as, uh, as possible. There's, there's ethics in this thing and, and morality in this thing because frankly, as he describes here, it's quite practical. You don't want to get burned beyond you know, confession, if right. you will. Uh, and then I go into my prayer time specifically right. because I, I want to come in as clean as possible. And that's the natural flow between step 10 and 11. You can Absolutely. To take that personal inventory when you're wrong, you promptly admit it to God. You experience that uh, immediate forgiveness is what I, what I get. And then it opens that door to, to prayer. And you want to increase your chances to have the best, you know, this thing of the capacity to receive, Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and, and nothing does that better than to, than to do a moral cleanup job, if you will. Right. You know, I think this is why the Oxford groups, they stress this so much because really the, their whole thing was, was to know God, to do his will and to carry his, his message to other people. I mean, this, obviously this is what gave birth to the 12 steps. There is no better way to come in contact with God than to work through your own uh, places where you need to be uh, trained, if you will. You know, I think this is why people come. If, maybe this is speculation, but I think this is fair. I think when people approach the absolutes and they look at them, they say, okay, yeah, that's fine, the honesty and all that. I think that the reason that purity is the one that is so hardest to swallow is because it runs contrary to some of our, our own instincts. And um, the instincts are, are vivacious and we say, oh my God, I don't want to, <laughs> does this mean I got to give up this or that or whatever right. else? And, um, you know, that, that seems like a prescription beyond something that we feel comfortable with most of the time. Uh, I was, again, I've been inspired by this reading I've been doing, but the blessed are the meek. Meek means to be, uh, the Greek, I guess, is praus, means to be broken and trained. Uh, meek means to be, in essence, it really it means to be trained. Those that are trained inherit the earth. And uh, this is an area in our lives. If we just are subject to our own desires, or subject to our own, uh, you know, instincts, if you will, we're going to be ruled by something other than God himself. And right. you got to, got to get a good look at what those things are. If you're, if you want to have any shot at all at having him run your life for you, because by that's default, right. you'll yeah. be run by them. <laughs> so that's, that's why they write, uh, this is in six and seven. This is the step that, that separate the men from the boys, uh, the girls from the women. Yeah, that's exactly mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, but it's a yep. big step. It's a big step, but it's central. It's, and that, I think there's something about it's being right in the middle of the 12 steps. It's, it's the heart of them. It really is. Yeah. It's the place where you go from, you know, a, a servant of God, if you will, to start to, to grow up and become a son of God. Right. It's initiatic. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> But there is a saving thing, uh, and that's what I love about Tom. He's he's always very practical, you know. <laughs> you know, so he says. But listen, if there's an emergency going on, in an emergency, you can and should forget the hygiene, and pray just as you are, even right yeah. in the trough with the pigs. <laughs> 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 so, you know. Um, it's just beautifully said that, uh, I mean, Wilson, Wilson, uh, he was on a high. He had, uh, he had given his life to God at the, at the Oxford group mission about two or three weeks before his time, yeah. his last time in town's hospital. Uh, and then he went into a deep, deep depression, you know, yeah. and yeah. boom, it, it knocked him to the ground. Yeah. You know? And that's when it happened. God, if there is a God, there's nothing left of me. I mean, I hope there's something out there, you know, and that's, that's the ego deflation of depth yeah. uh, that is really necessary uh, for, 
I, I think the kind of prayer that that uh, the high form of prayer where, where God's able to really get to us uh, is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I think that depression he experienced was pretty typical. It was uh, almost like the spirit had written a check that his ego didn't want to cash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and something in you that some innate thing that's in you knows it, you know, and uh, the ego knows it's when its days are over. It knows when its days are numbered. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happened. And it really, in, in, it really did come to, to that, you know. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes we, we bring that to our prayer in the morning. I mean, ego, ego doesn't go away. Ego has a tendency to inflate. And, and I don't think you can avoid that. Yeah. Yeah. But you can no, I identify think... it. <laughs> You can, hence, hence the, the moral cleanup job that you do bef exactly. beforehand. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he says, nothing complicated or obscure is suggested. Just clean up the simplest possible sense specifically so far as you are able. Stop lying, stop cheating, stop deceiving, stop guzzling, stop gorging, stop loafing, stop fornicating, stop envying, judging, and condemning, stop wallowing in self-pity, self-hatred, and self-concern. Stop hating and fearing your fellow man. Well, people, people uh, say, you know, well, I, I, um, I didn't find anything in my tenth step. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm always able to find something in my tenth step. You know. Uh, well, anybody who has that issue, I recommend they get married. <laughs> because they will very easily find out what should have been on their 10th step in the form of their wife. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Uh, I, sh I should ask my wife before I go into my <laughs> prayer time. What should I work on today? <laughs> <laughs> of, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm being silly, but, um, uh -huh. you know, it is, it is an exchange of, of reg you know, regular, ordinary life that these things do come to us. Right. And it is our job to be aware of what they are you know we are we we talked about this earlier that we for those of us that are not in monasteries we are we fall under the spiritual category of householder and it is in the daily exchanges of our life where we where we where these things are pointed out to us this is our laboratory this is where that's we're right. going to do our work that's right yeah it's the perfect laboratory yes and, it is we're going to get to that in a minute but uh uh, before we do, he, he lists he lists a couple of things here, and maybe you can enlighten us on this. But he talks about prayer as instinct, prayer as art, and prayer is breath. Can you can you take us through those? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, again, I um, the the prayer thing is as an instinct. I think very much. Again, I think of. Bill, this Bill Wilson experience is just so heavy on my mind. Of course, it is for many of us in the fellowship, but that mm -hmm. just at this, you know, strip back to the raw, naked desperation, there is this thing that, that exists that's there. It's as though uh, prayer is, is there constantly with us. I'm trying to think of which um, C.S. Lewis book it is, but he, he, the, um, the creation of the world, God is singing it into existence. Mm -hmm. And it's almost it's God's own word. Uh, what is the, the scripture? The word was made flesh and dwelled among us. It's almost as though <laughs> at some level, it is God's word himself that is, is the thing that keeps us alive and is our own existence. Yeah. And when you get ripped all the way back to nothing, there it is. And I think it was that that prayer was there with Bill Wilson the whole time, just layered over with all of the you know wall street stuff and the arrogance right. and everything else and finally you get stripped back and, and that's in a way there that's when it comes out it's you know pe pe people ha have have everything knocked out of them and and you know they, they undergo a crisis and it's oh my god it's 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 that kind of thing there's a natural oh god oh god you know yes it comes out of them where's it coming from and it's it's the same description that he gives of him of himself when he was in the mental hospital. This is Tom 
mm. describing his shock treatment, uh, where you know he here he is as an atheist, and he doesn't believe in God, mm. cast iron atheist, and he goes through this this shock treatment, and he hears somebody yelling, "God help me! God help me!" And as you know, he later realizes that it was he himself that was yelling. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the contradiction, how can an atheist be yelling for God? And then he realizes that God lives in all men. You know, some men have to be squeezed harder than others just to get to him. Mm -hmm. And this is this is the instinctive level of that God is there. And we sometimes we <laughs> have to get squeezed pretty hard to yeah. realize that he, that yeah. he was present all along. And, and the, the squeezed are the most in touch with the reality. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> More so than the yeah. guy who's, uh, you know, looking on his phone at the meeting or such. You know, it's, it's the new guy who's bleeding who uh, is more in, more likely to be in touch. So that instinct part is important. What about the yeah. art part? Uh, prayer is an art. What does he mean by that? Yeah, well, to be honest with you, I wish he was here. I'd love to ask him more, more about it personally. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and I, I think, um, I will say it very much makes me think of, uh, there is a, um, an Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox book uh, that's called The Art of Prayer. I know he recommended it very much. Uh, you know, I think of art as a, you know, as a, as a form of creation. Right. Creation itself is to participate in the creation of something that is already given to you. Yeah, and people have been writing about it and painting about it and trying to express it for hundreds of thousands of years. And, and what I take this to be is, you know, kind of that part of the book that says, big book, see where religious people are right. Yeah. You know, that if you're, yep. if you're, if you're going to do this prayer thing, you don't have to start from scratch. The instinct may, may, is there, but, but there's an art to this and you need to study that art. You know? and, yeah, and that's exactly right. It. Yeah. There was, there was a thing that I had um I had read once that the, uh, that the, that the school of people who actually designed these cathedrals, um, mm -hmm. that they had uh, somehow understood how to translate the certain, uh, and I don't know that much about music, but the tones or keys or whatever it was that, that in which they, the music first, that that was where it originated in the actual shapes. Well, they also designed them in such a way that it would, it would help elicit spiritual experience. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, so it's, of course, it's the, the art of it is, is communicated in writing. It's, right. it's communicated in, in, in actual artwork, but mm -hmm. also ar architecture, music. These are things mm -hmm. that communicate uh, actual conscious contact in ways that, you know, you, you want to, you can't do an end run around this aspect of prayer. Right. Uh, you know, in some, some of it is the best of all, because uh, you remember as our, you know, our AAA home group used, we would sing every Saturday night. Yeah. And some of, some of the things we'd actually sing were, were Irish drinking songs. You think, oh gosh, this seems so out of place. Uh, Not with and that yet, group. <laughs> yeah. The, the thing is that, that, that prayer takes so many forms and singing is, is a form of it. I mean, they say that singing is like praying twice or something, but it is a way to get around the logical mind. Remember the instinct is stripped way back, right? You know, prayer is an art in the form of singing, for instance. That's is, right. That, it, takes it goes, you, that takes you to the right brain, I believe. And you know? it bypasses, yes, it bypasses this logic chopping mind that that's is it. Yeah. That's which we it. need for yeah. food. We need yeah. it. That's right. And and yeah. and that's where the alcoholic and addict, I think, got stuck. I mean, I think we had an early experience of that, you know, in our initial contact with with the spirits, you know, in the bottle. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, this is wonderful. I want more of this. I think it's a, I think it's a, a problem of of our particular age as well. We live culturally in an age where people are just logic choppers. We're not we we are not open to 
things of a spiritual nature, if we can't see it or, or write it down somehow, right. it's not, it's not reality. We think this way all the time and right. uh, it, it yeah. handicaps us for sure. I think it's changing. I think, I think the pendulum has swung so far over in the science area, you know, yeah. and now yeah. I think it's starting to swing back. Um, I think so too. Yeah. I really do. So there's always hope. <laughs> there's always hope. There but it's going to come back different, you know. It, it's going to come back different. I mean, I get, uh, I get, I get off on Leonard Cohen songs. You know, to me, those are hymns. Those are those those yeah. are deeper hymns than than some of the hymns I hear in church. You know, from the 19th century and such. I mean, and like you say, you say the drinking songs. Well. Those drinking songs or those love songs or those cowboy songs, if if you see who the lover is, <laughs> yeah, they yeah. make they make real spiritual sense. Yeah, yeah, um, they do. Yeah, and then prayer is breath, and that's I guess. Uh, well, you you jump in on that. Prayer is breath. Yeah, I think a lot about this. There's uh, one of the Philokalia uh, fathers um, talked about this this combination of the heart the, and mind and joined together with the breath as in prayer and i thought mm -hmm. this is really interesting that there is a a psychophysical trinity um, between those things in the human person and that the that the the breath the lungs themselves sandwich the heart i never think about it that way but but uh there is an in, there's an influence over the heart mm. through the breath and I think, you know, half the time I'm using my breath to, you know, oh, that person, they did me wrong. And who do they think they are? And all this stuff there is when you, when you use your breath, it affects you, you know, at the heart level, at the emotional level, at the place in which the will is yeah, at the heart of a person. Of yeah. yeah. And there, there is this thing that prayer, obviously, you know, breath itself is the definition of spirit, you know, right. Uh, but there is there's something very powerful about its influence over us. Uh, you know, when when God created man, the, the story goes, he breathed into our nostrils. Uh, it, this is God in the form of, of breath. Yeah. Every time we get a chance to take such a breath, we are alive. Uh, and that happens, obviously, at a subtler level than just oxygen in the um, Midrash, which is a Jewish mm -hmm what do you want to call it? It's a, it's a, you know, this oral tradition, tradition that goes around. Yeah. And, right, yeah. It says that God had blown, blown, blown his breath through our nostrils because the, the nostrils of all the senses on man, the nostrils are the ones that are the most truthful in their discernment. Uh, if, if something you can, you can fudge around, uh, you know, what you hear and, and what you say and what you see, but the nose usually is the most honest. If something smells like crap, you know it. <laughs> he mm -hmm. said, that's why the, in the Midrash, it says that's why God had chosen the nostril because it's the most reliable in, in its discernment. Anyway, I don't know why I threw that in, but I found well, it I'll, interesting. Since you threw one in, I'm going to throw another Midrash <laughs> story in that right beneath the nostrils is the little indentation just above the lips. If you know what I mean, if you just put your finger above your lips, you're going to yes. find a little indentation right there. And, and, and what they said was that was when God pushed the spirit out of heaven and into life. That's his, his finger mark that was left there uh, on, on the body. There's beautiful little stories that, yeah. Uh, yeah. that reconnect the disconnected. And I think that's who addicts are. I mean, we're disconnected from our source and that's why prayer is i mean it's vital it's not just uh, something i ought to do it's it's something that if i don't do i'm not connecting with my own source and i'm going to pay a price for that yeah that's exactly yeah. right and it's and it's um you know of course we fall back all the time into the thing of box checking you know but it's yeah. when you when you remember this thing where he's talking about prayer as in as in love, you know, this is 
and I know it'll sound so darn corny, but this thing is, is a, this life is a love affair with God, you know, and we, <laughs> so, you know, it's, of course, there's a struggle. And it's God's between... love affair with us too. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. It, go, it goes both ways. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So I want to move on to uh, uh, three three practices that uh, Tom finishes up the book with, uh, and we'll finish up uh, this episode with these. He talks about the practice of abandonment, the practice of penetrating the cloud, and then the practice of continuous prayer. And I, I think it'd be good to just go through each one of those, uh, not in great depth, but uh, he has a book uh, for each one, and I'll put that in the in the show notes. But they're they're important books. So the practice of abandonment, abandonment, de Crusade. Yeah, I think um, you know we had talked before uh, about you know this thing of God's will, and that you don't that you want to be real careful that you don't make you know claims that um, uh, I'm doing God's will. You know, right. just like you wouldn't make any claims, I'm, I'm, I'm fully, you know, practicing absolute honesty and purity and unselfishness and love. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we can't make attempts to surrender. You know, where we where we turn our will and life over to God. Now we can't make we can't make ourselves do that, but we can. There are certain things we can do that can elicit the response uh, from God that can that can produce a surrender for us. There's one paragraph in here I felt that was really important. Um, he, he says, so what is surrender? Mm -hmm. It is a giving up of the egotistical, self-centered notion that I, just as I am, mm -hmm. can direct and run my own life effectively and well. Surrender or abandonment is preceded by a keen appreciation that without conscious cooperation with the higher power, I do not properly know how to eat, to sleep, to work. And most certainly, I do not know how to love or pray or rejoice in life. And, um, you know, we've talked a lot about this, the Genesis account, you know, and essentially, you know, this thing where we had, if we had fallen, if we had fallen into anything, we had fallen into this egotistical notion that I, I can run my life. I can handle yeah. things myself. I am separate from God. I'm separate from God and hence, right. you know, the realization of our own bodies as naked. Right. I mean, you can't separate from God is, is the truth. You can only do it in your head. <laughs> that's right. And that's a terrible place to be. And that's where we wind up. You know? That's where we wind up. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's you almost don't... like you got to wind up there if you're ever going to get back. You know? And you, it seems and to you be don't... necessary. You usually don't find yourself there uh, willy nilly. You know, it usually right. comes after a series of of pretty awful decisions that we make in regards to our own life, yeah. and uh, it comes back to us. Uh, so the source that he talks here about. So there's three again, three major books as you mentioned, and he says one of the best sources of teaching on the, on the art of surrendering or, mm -hmm. or abandonment right. is self-abandonment to divine providence, which was a, a French Jesuit priest. And uh, it's a yeah. terrific book. I guess at the time he wrote this, it was in two form. It was two books. Um, I've heard you mention, I think it was you that said that you, that you preferred them in two. Um, was that you? Uh, I, I'll take credit for it, but it was it a good thing. <laughs> I, you know, I can't remember. I thought it might have been you that, that said you preferred them in two in two different books instead of one. But regardless, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, his teaching on self abandonment to divine providence, yeah. and the second half are, is spiritual letters, which were yeah. These are all all published after his death. All the letters mm -hmm. he sent to um the nuns that were under his spiritual direction. Right. Um, teaching them about this very art. This is this it, talking about art. This is an art to learn how to to practice uh, surrender. And he brings it into the present moment. It's Eckhart Tolle, uh, I think, read some of De Crusade. 
before he wrote his some of his book but I mean, yeah, that's you the would... key of it it's the present moment you find god by practicing the sacrament of the present moment yeah that's right i mean there's so no here's a nice little quote it is not yep. necessary he says to know the will of god in advance but to accept it to abandon yourself to it as it unfolds in your life from moment to moment. Yeah, that's right. That's why I think, again, it's really important that we that he made that critical, critical distinction about doing God's will, because um, right. to actually participate in the will of God, it, it requires us to live intentionally, to live consciously, to be aware of the present moment. Right. And and in the present <laughs> moment, good things may not be happening. That's right. That's right. There, the, whatever it is that's in the present moment. Whatever is, it is. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And we find ourselves very often in some form of, of projection. You know, if we're into, into worry, we're usually into the future. If we're into regret, right. we're usually thinking about the past. That's right. Uh, you know we're all over the place and uh -huh. and god's will itself can only be here and now that's the only place we can make contact with it right it's yeah. it's it's happening yeah and it's and it's okay yes it's okay it's painful yes. uh and and i can't attribute it to god but it is reality and I can't deny the reality, and God is the great reality. Uh -huh. Yeah, without doing harm to ourselves, which is what we've been doing, right? Our whole addictive career. It's it's you know I've always been a little bit sad uh, that uh, we only say the first half of the Serenity Prayer in our meetings, but the second half has some key ingredients. You know, taking this sinful world as it is, not as we would have it but trusting that you will make all things right if we surrender to your will. I mean, there it is. Yeah. That's yeah. practicing the present moment and finding God in it and ab abandoning myself to it. You know, doesn't mean I wallow in it, um, but it does mean that it, it does mean that it has meaning. You know, yeah. yeah, it has meaning. I may not be able to see the meaning, you yeah, know, but it's it's there. I, I did want to read because uh, it's a mind blower. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the. Uh, in well, a I, was, practical... I was going to read. I was going to read this quote from. Yeah. Uh, let go me read it. this quote from uh, Jung because it's kind of saying the same thing. Uh, he was asked in an interview, you know, who is God? He says, "To this day, God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path." violently and recklessly, all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or worse. Yeah, that's exactly right. I was going to say that the way that people tend to approach this idea uh, or, or thing itself, I don't want to call it an idea, is, um, you know, the mm -hmm. step says we made a decision. I like words. I'm not super great into them, but I like to, you know, the definition, the etymology, where words come from and what they mean. And I'd, yeah. of course, heard, you know, to de decision means to cut in half and so on and so forth. But I had a friend recently, he had said, he talked about the, um, that uh, the, the words homicide, suicide, decide, they all have, uh, you know, there is, there is a certain meaning built into each one of those it has to do yes. with kill, killing, you know, a suicide yeah. is when you kill yourself, a homicide is killing someone else to decide means to kill one of two options. You know, when you come into this life, this is how you live. You're going to be running your own show. Uh, you know, now you come up against this thing of for the first time, maybe uh, now there's a consideration to live in a different way. And so now you've got both mm -hmm. things going at the same time. Now, this doesn't just happen when you first get in here. This happens every morning you wake up. 
<laughs> do I do my prayers That's or right. do I do something else? Do I, you know, express right. my anger towards my children or my wife or do, you know, do I, do I fart off here and come into work late or do I actually, you know, get myself together and come in? We're constantly up against this thing where this duplicitous thing, do I do my will or do I do this right thing? And to decide means that the, that the, this option of living by the way I want is to be killed. The relationship of it is, mm -hmm. is to be dead now. It is to live unified, uh, to live by one will instead of this multiple wills, this fragmented will, weak as it is, that, I, that I'm carrying around with me. Right. Yeah, it's uh, helpful for us to think yeah. of it that way. Uh, right. Uh, and and, and all I, for me, impossible to stay there, but always to be welcomed back. You know, my ego fights things. You know? Yeah, very often we find ourselves, you know, he mentioned the thing that, that, that we have uh, our access to the truth as an ally in, in crises, you know, and, and um, that's right. That's usually how I find out that fortunately, because of this way of life, the crises are less, you know, that they're, they're blunted, you know, they're not as, right. as sharp and as hard as they used to be, thank God. Right. But, but, but they're there. And if I ignore them, then of mm -hmm. course they will, you know, as Lewis talks about, you know, God uses pain as a megaphone, you know, like <laughs> the more I ignore them, the, the louder they have to be to wake me yeah. up to it. Right. The second one he talks about is, um, you know, uh, the practice um, of, of penetrating the cloud. Uh, you talk about that book a little bit. Um, yeah, sure. Um, there's, I guess, some of the, the modern version of, of, of uh, the, um, the cloud of unknowing. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people read um, Father Thomas Keating's book. I always mm -hmm. get it backwards. Is it open heart, open mind? Or open mind, open heart? I think it's open heart, open mind. Um, but it is, it, it, it is very much aligned with this, this idea of, of the practice of the quiet time. Um, mm -hmm. there is some, you know, there's an actual practice that's there. And I recommend those that would like to, to learn it, of course, to go to the original source, but here, and uh, Tom talks about actually taking time out, doing it the same time each day mm -hmm. in the same place if possible. Mm -hmm. And you, and you actually, um, you're showing up, you're giving yourself to this practice. And, um, he, he gives, a. uh, yeah, an account of himself, an exchange he had with a Episcopal priest at the time, who basically set him up on what he called the wedge approach. Um, prior to that, Tom was doing some time and skipping and then more time. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, you just do 10 minutes a day or 15 mm -hmm. minutes a day, period. And do that faithfully, like brushing your teeth. Right. And this is pr a practice, you know, yeah. a real practice. Um, the idea is to penetrate the cloud. In essence, that is to, to reach conscious contact, mm -hmm. to, make, to make some kind of contact with God, make the attempt. You can't force, again, you can't force that any more than you can force a surrender. Um, but you can, you can give of yourself. You can give your time. You can give your interest. And um, you can do it each day. And if you do it each day and you do it faithfully, you will, it will elicit a response. God That's will... Right. Um, it will give you something. Yeah, and the Oxford group people were very big on writing down the responses that they received. And, and that was uh, key for me uh, because I had a record of it, you know? And I, I could look at what I was being guided to do and then ask myself, did I do it? You know, that there's, there's something, um, oh, there's something in me that is not very obedient. Uh, that's, this is my ego, you know? And so just even, you know, people ask, well, is, it, is this from God? Is it from me? You know, if it's a good thing, just do the damn thing. Yeah. And be yeah. obedient. You know? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, again, that goes that goes back to the thing of prowse, you know, to be broken and to be trained. Right. You know? Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. I just had an image of a little dogs, you know, you you're trying to teach them to roll over or sit. I don't think that's a really good idea, the dog says back to you. <laughs> well, I've mentioned it. I'm a I'm a farmer, so it means yeah. a lot to me. Also, and you, you you mentioned the thing of being in the trough with the pigs. Well, I've done yeah. that too. Uh -huh. uh, but um, you know, when you work with an animal and you're trying to train them, yeah. uh, I'm thinking mostly like I work the biggest thing I work with were our cattle, you know, I might right. be working with a big bull or something like that, or 12 or 1400 pound cows. And the best way to train a cow is, um, is it has to do with the environment in which they're in. If you have, if you've got a weak fence somewhere or, or, or a gate that they know they can knock over, they will yeah. knock it over every time. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really, it has to do with the parameter in which you set up for them in which to, to teach them, to train them, yeah. you know? And of course you train with, you know, things like their food and, and so forth. Uh, but it's really important if you're, if your parameters for them to work inside has, has some breachable place or some weakness, it will always get breached. Yeah. It'll always be broken down. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is for us. So to, the, the parameters in which we set for ourselves to train first thing each day is this is this quiet time right you know that's right and it is for me if you bring your cell phone in you're gonna that's a that's a weakness in the fence it's going to yeah. be breached i do bring my coffee in and god seems to be okay with that yeah <laughs> well there's a long tradition of that yeah, right. there is a whole spanish order i, I take it <laughs> that used to for meditation reasons but so you're, you're <laughs> bring their coffee you're, <laughs> you're sanctified in your use of coffee well, in AA, we're keeping up that tradition. So they're, they're, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing our part. The last sure. one is a book that's been very helpful for me. And that is, uh, he speaks about the, the practice of continuous prayer and brings up the way of a pilgrim. Could you introduce us to that? Yeah, yeah. I also, I think of the, the couple of references in the big book, not that they were necessarily referring to this, this source, um, Firstly, the, the, the practice is the Jesus prayer, and the book is called The Way of a Pilgrim. Mm -hmm. um, but they, but they, he says somewhere that, um, you know, don't be shy on this matter of prayer. There, there are those who are using it, something to, there are those who are using it continuously. Mm -hmm. um, the other is, um, uh, we say many times throughout the day, thy will not mine be done. Right. Um, it, what, it, what, it, what it is here, we talked about, you know, cleaning ourselves up before we, we, come to prayer um, because, because we can drag the ego, as you said, we drag the ego into prayer. Some of the best ways to help us not drag ego into prayer is short prayers, mm -hmm. quick, quick little darting prayers. And um, that's what this technique is. He talks about it as it is universally known as, um, uh, well, I guess this is a Sanskrit word, maybe it's japam. Mm -hmm. um, it is the, it's known as the prayer of the name or a, or a mantra. Mm -hmm. uh, the main source that was helpful to him was, was uh, the way of a pilgrim. He, um, you know, he mentions in the very beginning of the book of, as being a spiritual mongrel. He was, um, you know, when he finally had that, that experience in the hospital where he heard himself yelling for God, he became a theist. He became open to, uh, at that point, he became open to learning from anyone who took God seriously, regardless mm. of whatever religion they may be. Uh, mm. He had an aversion to Christianity, as many of us do that are brought up in the West. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time he got a hold of the way of a pilgrim, he, he um, in a way, I think it, it helped melt that uh, aversion. And um, he, you know, he saw it in a bookstore he thought, you know, what, what the hell is this thing? And he, he purchased it and um, the introduction didn't impress him much, but when he got to the actual text itself, he, you know, the thing reads like you're know, reading Leo Tolstoy or something. I mean, it's, it's beautifully written. Yeah. And it's short. It's, it's relatively short. It's a real classic, you know, it's a, a Russian peasant uh, who, who is trying to answer the question, you know, how do you pray continuously? without ceasing. How do you do that? 
It runs around yeah. and asks a bunch of people and gets some terrible answers. And then somebody teaches them this, uh, this short Jesus prayer. It says, this is how you do it. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the, the, um, the prayer itself is, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. There are variations that are longer. Right. Um, you know, anybody can, no matter what your religious affiliation, you can say, Lord God Almighty, right. have mercy on me. It doesn't, right. you know. Uh, he, he refers in this book here that, that um, in Tom's book that Gandhi used Ramanama. Um, you know, it's, it's a short phrase where you call in the name of God. And it makes me think very much of, 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 a, of someone that is in a critical, you know, critical condition of falling, let's say falling through the ice. Right. You know, when, you, when that happens, the thing that you do is you yell for whomever it is you think is most likely to hear you. Mm-hmm. And as we talked about um, earlier, that, um, you know, God is with us. He's with us at all times. We're not consciously aware of him most of the time. And this is an attempt to call out to whom is closest to us, um, not just for saving, although the word mercy, uh, mm-hmm. again, to go back to etymology, there's this great um, translation of the word means literally to jump into one's skin, you know, to see and feel and think what another person thinks and feels and sees. In, in essence, we're asking God to enter us, to, to come into us, mm-hmm. uh, you know, this intimate thing. Um, but it's, it is for many people in, in the 12-step program, I've, I've heard them use it in times of, of critical, you know, when they're in temptation whether it's a sex temptation or they find themselves in front of the refrigerator at midnight and they want to stuff their face or right. whatever, just to keep calling on God's name to be as persistent with that prayer as the temptation is persistent in soliciting them. Or on the other side of that, if things have gone really well and you know what's going to happen to you as a result of that, that ego is going to reinflate, you know, Yeah, and you need it then every bit as much. You, you do. And, and also yeah. to say it, you know, to say it at times when you're not under temptation so that you're more likely to when you are, you know, yeah. it's a very, very powerful prayer. And um, uh, I know that, um, you know, Bill Wilson was working with the prayer as, you know, of course, Tom was. There were many, many in that in that AA circle that were mm. that were using the Jesus prayer for sure. So There's what a, Tom talks about, uh, I don't know if it's in this section or another, where, where he talks about uh, just just trying to do this for longer and longer periods of time, three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, uh, where you can where it can become more natural and and you're saying it uh, and it becomes prayer of the heart, you know? Yeah, it sinks yeah. down like you were saying before. Yeah. And everything he gives, he, he always seems to give us some practical way uh, yeah. to approach it. And he talks about taking the time. He was on a uh, uh, train ride into the city from where he lived at the time, which was Tra- Chappaqua, New York. And yeah. um, that he was able to just take the 10 minutes or whatever it was. He would pick it up at a certain, I don't remember if it was Hawthorne or something. And it was, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to the, to the city. Grand Central. The Grand yeah. Central was going, yeah. And he would I rode just... that train. Uh, my son lives up that Did way. Did you? Yeah, you know, I thought I thought of him. I said the prayer when I was on the train. <laughs> oh, that's great. I, I have actually seen the 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 station, uh, um, but I've never I never got to ride it. But I, yeah. I think of that very often. And at one point he says he he was at he had the experience where he was so high, he had to stop the prayer and say, God, help me get my feet back on the ground because I've got a full day's day of work ahead of me. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful prayer. And I, I really recommend I, everybody I work with, I always recommend they, they, that they use it. Yeah. No, uh, simplest, simplest thing in the world. And, and yet one of the most powerful. It's, yeah. It's, yep. It's, uh, it's beautiful. Well, listen, Matt, I, I want to thank you uh, for leading us through this book. I think it's been a, a, a wonderful uh, exercise, uh, and um, I, I got a tremendous amount out of it and greater respect for the book than I've ever had before. If people want to get a copy of the book, uh, go to the show notes. 
Uh, you can buy it uh, at reasonable price from All Addicts Anonymous, and we'll put the link in there. If you try to buy it on the open market, uh, there's a lot of gorging going on, so try, try to avoid that. And uh, and if you're in bad financial straits, uh, I think if you'll write to Matt, they'll be happy to send you uh, an electronic copy of the book as well. And, and just one last thing is... Uh, I didn't know if I was going to put this into this series, or but uh, and I decided not to. But there's a, a marvelous piece that I came across in, in I think it was the mid '70s when I first saw it, uh, called Gre Alcoholics Anonymous and Gresham's Law, and and it's about the watering down of AA, and I, and I want to do um, kind of a special podcast with Matt on. Uh, on that subject and introduce folks to that. And I, I think it'll be a, a, a wonderful lesson. It, it really got my attention. And, uh, and um, so there you got that to look forward to. Um, so Matt, thank you so much. Uh, it's been wonderful having you and re-engaging with you. And um, um, can't yeah, thank you th enough, man. Just yeah, thank same you. here. Th thank you so much. It's been a real honor and a pleasure to, you know, go through these uh, episodes together. And I look forward to the Gresham's Law piece. Yeah. Okay. We'll do that in, yeah. in a couple of weeks or so. Yeah. And thanks it, so yeah. much. Okay. And thank you guys uh, for listening, for joining in. Uh, once again, if you want to join us for the two-way prayer workshop, it's coming up on December the 11th. That's a Saturday from 10 to 1230 central time. And, uh, do check out the website Two Way Prayer. Okay. If you want to get in touch with Matt, you can write to him at alladicsanonymous at gmail.com. And you can write to me at two way prayer at gmail.com. So thanks so much. God bless and keep coming back. <laughs>